All right, everybody, happy Easter. Man, you guys look great out there. Uh, I'm saying in faith you look good in Madison, too, and in Hartzell and online. We already had like eight campuses in Uganda have Easter like eight hours ago. So I know some of you guys online are joining us from Africa, even at Daystar Church. Hey, I think this is the best day of the year. So many people are worshiping the risen Savior. Let's all clap our hands for him right now. Wherever you are, Jesus, you're worthy of our praise. and We lift you up. Man, I can't wait to jump into this talk today about the resurrection, but I have to say, I want you all back next Sunday, every single person, because we're starting this new series I think is going to be beneficial to you. I think it's going to pique your curiosity. It's called Asking for a Friend. So if uh, you have questions that you'd really kind of like to ask me, but you kind of not like to ask me, that's the kind of questions we're asking for, okay? And in, in your worship guide, in the Connect card, there's a place for you to ask those questions. And what we're going to do is over the next five weeks, every Sunday morning when I get up here to preach, I'm preaching on your questions. The things you want to know about, we're going to go through, and we're going to just try to give you what the Bible says about those issues. We're going to try to keep opinions short and truth long, all right? We're going to have a lot of truth in that series. And so if you're online with us right now, you can click on the online connect card, fill that out, ask us your questions. And we may not get to all of them. It's only five weeks, but we're going to get as many of those questions as we can. And I'll go ahead and tell you what we're talking about next Sunday. It is the question of our nation right now. And that is how should Christians approach the transgender or all gender issues right now? What's the Bible say about that? What would God or Jesus say to the LGBT community? What is the word of God and how should a Christian respond to that? So that's where we're going next Sunday. <laughs> so let that sink in on you, all right? We're going right there next Sunday, and I want you to be back because it's an issue you need to know the heart of God on. God has a heart for that issue, and I, I believe we're going to share that with you. I just want everybody to be back anyways because growing in Christ is about regular discipleship, growing with the people of God, so just welcome. If you haven't been here in a long time, welcome back, man. I hope you feel at home. You deserve this. This is your church family, and we want you back every single week. Can I get a big amen? All right, today is Resurrection Sunday, and I'm pumped about that, y'all. This is why we are here. The reason we do Sunday every week, the reason, by the way, that we're going to look into God's Word over the next several weeks to answer questions is because He rose from the dead. And if Jesus did not rise from the dead, everything else doesn't matter. I'm not talking about a figurative um, poetic rising. I mean a physical bodily resurrection from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, everything about Christianity is a hoax and it doesn't matter at all. The good news is he did rise. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah, he rose on the third day. In fact, I want to talk to you about two different things today. I want to talk to you about the reality of the resurrection. I also, also want to talk to you about the reason for the resurrection. Now, he rose, and the title of my, my talk today is The One and Only, because there's no one like Jesus. There have been religious leaders. There have been great teachers. There have been people that people modeled their life after, but nobody said, hey, what's going to happen is I'm going to die, and then I'm not going to be dead anymore, and then did that. Nobody did that except Jesus. I mean, he is, like that song says, the undefeated champion of hope and love. I mean, they killed him, but death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him, and he rose on the third day. He told the people who were going to kill him, hey, you're going to destroy this temple right here, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up again. They did it. They didn't trust him. They didn't believe it. They hung him on a cross. He bled out his last. All his friends left him. They put him in the ground on Friday. It looked like the worst day in the world. But guess what happened? Three days later, which happened to be about 2,000 years from right now, he got up, y'all. Come on. He got up. And that matters most of all not to establish a religion or to prove we're right and somebody's wrong. It matters most of all in that little statement that says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. It, what, what it means is like if, if there was enough power to take a dead man back to life, then there's enough power to deliver you from drug addiction. Then there's enough power to set you free from your alcohol problem. 
If there's enough power to raise a dead man to life, there's enough power to put your family back together, to hold your mental faculties together, to set you free from depression or the fear, your anxiety you're struggling with. Like the power that raised him from the dead is alive for us today. See, if you take out your notes, I'm going to start with the what, and then I'm going to go to the why. The what of this Sunday is the resurrection. The, the physical bodily resurrection. Now, if you were to watch a movie about uh, the crucifixion or even just pick up the Bible and read a few chapters right there where he was crucified, it seems like a horrible miscarriage of justice. They just grabbed him and took him away and did this awful thing. But if you read the whole story, I mean the Bible from front to back, you'll begin to notice that it was actually not the Jews' plan to kill Jesus or the Romans' plan to kill Jesus. It was God's plan to kill Jesus. We first see it on like page two of your Bible. In Genesis 3, the Bible says the serpent is going to bruise the heel of the seed of woman. That's Jesus. But don't worry because the man is going to crush his head. Do you see that in the first book of the Bible? And when the crucifixion begins, uh, Matthew tells us that Jesus was beaten severely before he was ever hung on the cross. Now, Matthew said that because Matthew was there. He saw it and he wrote it down. But 700 years before that happened, a prophet by the name of Isaiah wrote in his, uh, in his prophecy that it was going to happen just like that. Another guy who was there was John. And in John 18, he tells us that they took Jesus' robe off of him and they gambled for the robe. But did you know that centuries before that, Psalm 22 told us that's what's going to happen. We all know he hung on a tree, right? He hung on a, on a piece of wood. But 1,500 or so years before that happened, the book of Genesis told us he was going to be lifted up onto wood. It's almost like God is telling us, hey, y'all, I got this. <laughs> I know this seems bad, but I got a plan. 500 years before they stabbed him in the side to see if he was dead and the blood and water flowed revealing he was dead, an old prophet named Zechariah said, they will mourn the one whom they pierce. You know, when, when, when the, the three were hanging there, two criminals and Jesus, they broke the legs of the two criminals, which is what you normally do in a crucifixion. But for some reason, they didn't break Jesus' legs, and that would have been a shock to everybody except King David five centuries earlier who said, nobody's going to break his bones. I mean, it's almost like God is telling us, I got this. And I think probably the best uh, prediction, you know, was that he would be put in a borrowed tomb, and that he wouldn't stay there for very long. Two different authors on two different continents who spoke two different languages said that to us, that he wouldn't stay in the tomb for very long. And guess what? There were two women who found that prophecy to be true 500 years after it was spoken, and they're the first preachers of the gospel. I find that so beautiful and so Jesus, <laughs> that the first people who knew Jesus rose from the grave were two women, and they got to preach the gospel before anybody else did. It's also kind of interesting that 2,000 years later, some churches still don't know if women can preach. I messed you up right here on Easter, didn't I? Just write that down on your little note card. I'll get to that in a couple weeks, all right? But they went in the tomb, and an angel told these women. Look at it, Matthew 28. The angel said to the women, I'm going to need your help in just a minute. Get ready. Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Let me have four words. Y'all say it with me. He is not here. Woo! Woo! Did you feel that? If you didn't feel somebody that did feel it, and it'll run up on you. <laughs> Woo. He is not here. Three more words. Come on, y'all. Say it with me. He has risen, just as he said. Man, they shot out of that empty tomb, started telling people. The first people they told were the disciples. And, and you know what happened after that is no less than 500 people saw Jesus up and alive walking around. It's, it's historically proof. I mean, Bible writers talk about it. Historians who were not believers talk about it. 500 people saw him alive. And the disciples were the last ones to see him on earth. He was ascended into heaven right before their very eyes. And maybe the same angel who said that to those women spoke to them in Acts 1 and 11 and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking to the sky? Come on, give me three more words, church. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go. Y'all, that's what we're living on. 
That's what we're here for today. This story is not a hoax. It's not a made-up idea of men that, that, that can't be proven. It's not a fairy tale. There are biblical writers and historical writers who tell about these events. And you know what? There were, there were Old Testament prophets who cried out in anonymity for centuries, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And nobody would believe them, but Jesus came, and he's coming again. Just like this angel said it, he's coming again, and you're the reason why. Don't you ever doubt it. You, you're his daughter, you're his son, you matter to him. And this broken and fallen world that you're struggling through and you're fighting through, and you think it's your fault, why don't I get my crap together? Why don't I straighten up? Why can't I do better? Let me tell you, it's a broken world. And God doesn't want you to live. He wants to help you through a broken world, but he wants to take you to a perfect world. That's why he's coming back. He's coming back for you to let you know that there is more for your life than this broken place. You know, and one more prediction that I can't overlook. There are dozens of predictions Jesus fulfilled on one day. But I love the one in Isaiah 52 that says that Jesus would be numbered among thieves. That when they, when they captured and crucified him, they put him among thieves. Now that sounds like uh, quite an insult to the Son of God. To be put between two thieves. But I think that was where Jesus was most comfortable. I mean, I think he loved being around thieves and prostitutes and, 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 and liars and rebels. I mean, that's where he seemed to hang out all the time. He was much more comfortable with them than with church folks. Sometimes them is the church folks we should just go ahead and point out. <laughs> and Jesus knew that too, right? But hanging naked... You know, I've seen all, we've all seen the pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross. He's, you know, he's got his, his feet down and, and he's got that, that cloth on him. But we just read that they gambled for that cloth. He wasn't wearing that cloth. He was bleeding to death, having been beaten near death, and he was naked on the cross. And he was talking to these two criminals. <laughs> and he told the one who was repentant today, you're going to be with me in my God's kingdom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And that wasn't the only criminals that he uh, loved on that day. The very men who were at his feet and crucifying him, he forgave them too. In fact, he prayed to the Father for the Father to forgive them. And it brings me to the most beautiful and wonderful truth in the whole world is this, that if God could forgive the men who murdered his son, he can forgive anyone of anything. Isn't that true for you today? I mean, if God could forgive that, some, some of you, I, every time I, I look up at the wonderful people who lead worship here, man, they are so energetic. They convince me. Do they convince, aren't they good? Can y'all give them a hand, all these people up here singing, giving it to God? I mean, they convince me. And 99% and, and of my head is like, let's do this. Y'all are pumping me up. 1% of my head is like, somebody's out there going, these people are crazy. Like they're going, you know, and, and, and somebody's out here saying, man, I just came because my grandma would not shut up about Easter. And I'm just here hoping the roof don't fall in on me. And I'm not like these goody two-shoe singers up here in the white clothes doing the thing for Jesus. And, you know, and, and you just don't know. I'm not like all y'all. I got stuff in my past. I got stuff in my life. Let me tell you something. This story is your story. Because there is a mountain of sins worse than you've ever thought of that's already under the blood of Jesus. Millions of people who've done far worse than anybody in this room have turned to Jesus and he has washed their sins away. And that is why we are who we are. That is why we are this church. That is why we are here today. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then there's no power to set you free or me either. But he did. <laughs> Come on one more time, clap your hands and praise him for that power that sets us free. Now, that's the what, the resurrection. I really want to talk about the why, though. The why is the redemption. It's, it's, it's taking us back. And I want to tell a story. You know, Jesus never taught without telling stories. That's what the Bible says. In Jesus' day, nobody had cell phones and smart TVs and screens like this. There was no Netflix or nobody watching satellite TV or even going to the movies. To entertain each other, they told stories, fables. They, they, they told stories. And Jesus told stories, and his favorite story, his most famous story, story of the prodigal son. It's a story that he changed. A lot of people think this is original to Jesus. It was a popular story before Jesus, but he changed the ending of it. He did, I call this Jesus' at the movie sermon, all right? 
Because we do that in June. We, we put movies up on these big screens and we film parts of those movies and we, we change the story to make it redemptive. That's what Jesus did with this story. So let me tell you the story. He, he said that there was a nobleman who had lots of money and land, a sprawling estate. He had servants and millions of dollars and possessions. And he had two sons. And one of the two sons, the younger one, said, Dad, I don't, I don't want to be in this family anymore. I don't like how you live. I'm going to show you how to live. Give me my half of the inheritance right now, and I'm out of here. Now, how many of you fathers would give your son half? I'd give him something. <laughs> I'd be like, I got a stack of two-by-fours just for you, son. Here's the first one. <laughs> but the father gave him half of the family's wealth, and the boy, the Bible says, went to a far country where he wasted it all with wild living. Now, I know as holy and Easter as y'all look, y'all never done no wild living. But what happens when you do wild living is there's lots of friends to do wild living with you. When you got money and and you're going crazy, there's people to help you go crazy and spend your money. But when the money's gone, it's just you and the crazies all's left. That's what happened to him. And it brings up the first point I want you to write down in your notes and think about. The farther you move away from God, the lower your standards become. He said, Father, I'm going to a far country and then I'm going to get crazy. That's what happens in real life even today. When you start getting away from God, your standards get lower. Church is not important for me. You know, I know Jesus. No, you're getting away from God and your standards are getting lower. And that's important right now. It's important in 2021 because our country and our culture is in the middle of an evolution of ethics right now. See, we're the most blessed people on planet Earth. Uh, We're not perfect. Things are not perfect in America. But what is good is good because God made it good. And you slice up this culture any way you want to. Every educational side, every color, every religion, every age group is doing better than their counterparts in anywhere else in the world. And that is because of God's blessing. And and see, there's always been an anchor in our culture to the Bible, to the Christian values of God's word. But we've kind of let that go. And you're hearing popular figures like, you know, sports athletes and and movie stars and and famous people and especially politicians saying things like, well, I've evolved on that issue. I I know you got video of me saying this 10 years ago, but now I believe this over here. I've evolved. And that translation is, I stuck my finger in the wind and the wind blew this way, so I blew with the wind. Because I don't have a backbone and I don't have an anchor. See, our world has lost its anchor. That anchor is the truth of Jesus Christ. And when you move farther away from that anchor, your standards get lower and lower and lower. And the opposite of this is true. If you flip and reverse this around, check this out. This statement is true if you look at it that way. The lower your standards become, the farther you move away from God. When you start saying, you know what, I don't, I don't want to be the oddball at my work or at school. I don't want to be the only person that believes like I believe. I, so I'm going to go over here where everybody else is. I'm going to hang out over here, and, 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 and you know, I don't want to be seen as crazy. What's going to happen is when you lower your standards, you're going to move farther and farther away from God. And eventually, you've got no anchor. And there is no truth. That's the same problem that was going on in Jesus' day. Do you remember Roman governor Pontius Pilate asked Jesus famously, what is truth? And see, he didn't know what truth was. And our culture doesn't know what truth is. Jesus said plainly, I'm the truth. Look at it right here. He says in John 14 and 6, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Come on, say it with me. No one. No one goes to the Father. No one makes it to heaven. Nobody finds God's grace except through Jesus. Y'all, when we cut off the anchor to God and God's word, we drift farther and farther away from the Father and the hope and the peace of our future. And so this, this young boy, the Bible says he came to his senses and he said, I will arise and go. Everybody say those two words, arise, go. To arise in the original Greek means to change your position. Some of us need to change our position. We've made some mistakes. We let things that were not as important take precedent over what is most important. You know what? No big deal. Let's change our position. And then let's let's go. See, because the most important line in this young boy's story was that he got going. He he just had a plan until he got going. And everybody's got a plan, y'all. Let me tell you my plan. I'm planning to be on Smith Lake this summer, washboard abs. It's the longest standing tradition in our family. Not the abs, the plan. 
I've had the plan for a really long time. Also, I like washboard apps, also like donuts. So the plan's not going to work until I stop with the donuts. Can I get an amen from the mans up in here? Like, you, just having a plan doesn't mean anything. A lot of us got plans. You know what? I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be more giving this year. I'm going to stop judging people. I'm going to not lose my temper. I'm going to quit drinking. You know, I'm going to do something. To, I'm going to break the chains that make me so embarrassed. I, I'm going to stop with the porn. All these plans. Young people are saying, like, I'm, I'm going to date the right person that God has for me and not the wrong. Those are wonderful plans, but you got to get moving on your plan. Plan. You see, when the boy got moving on his plan, he was literally living in a pig sty. The Bible says that he had lost all his money, couldn't even feed himself, and went to work for a Greek who was uh, raising pigs, and he was so hungry, the story says, he wanted to eat with the pig. And he came to his senses and said, you know what? My father's got servants just like I'm a servant. I, I'm not worthy. I, I, I've abdicated the family. I can't be his son anymore, but I can be his servant. I can be a hired yard servant and eat better than this. And so he arose and he got moving with his plan. And what you're going to find out in Jesus' story here is what the Bible tells us later, that if you draw near to God, God will do what, church? Draw near to you. Let that sink in. If I'll just draw near... He'll draw near to me. I don't feel like I can get there. I'm a million miles. No, just draw near, and he'll draw near to you. And here's how it went for the uh, prodigal son. He got up, and he went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him filled with compassion, and he ran. You see what he did? He drew near himself to the son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, here's where the son started with his plan. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. Your plan to get your life straight is an imperfect plan because you're an imperfect person. That's okay. Start drawing near to him. And along the way, God's going to interrupt your plan with his plan. Oh, you weren't ready for it. That was better than you were ready for. God has a better plan. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you hope and peace and an expected future. That's God's plan. And so the son comes in and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just make it uh, a little bit better. I'm going to live in the yard. I'm going to be a, a yard servant and I'll, I'll be able to eat better. And the father says, no. He shuts him up and he says, the father said to his servants, quick, bring my best robe. Somebody say best. That's what God wants you to have. Put it on his, on his back. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring out the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now, at first, it seems like the father is saying, he's been in a pigsty and he smells. Let's clean him up. Let's get him better clothes. He lost his shoes. Let's get him shoes. But there are four things this says to us I want to tell you in closing. And if you're taking notes, write these down so you can remember. The robe is symbolic of an identity change. He said, get the best robe. He didn't say get a robe. He said the best robe. You know who owns the best robe in a millionaire's mansion? The millionaire. <laughs> he said, go get my robe. I want you to get this picture. 24 hours earlier, the boy is wallowing in pig slop. One day later, he's wearing the father's robe. You know what God's trying to tell you? You think you're a million miles away from the Father, being who you're supposed to be, being what you need to be. you got to go through 18 classes, and you got to tell 47 people you're sorry. And listen, go through the classes, tell people you're sorry, but the moment you come running back to the Father, the Father's going to meet you there, and he's going to change your identity in that moment. You're not going to wait 18 weeks for it to happen the moment you do it. He said, give him the best robe, my robe. And then he said, put a ring on his hand. This one's important. That's a status change. It, it, it was a signet ring where we get the word signature. And it was what we would now call a signature, which would represent, you know, who you are. And it, it was a legal uh, signing. They did it with a ring. And if the father wanted to spend money or, or sign an agreement with someone, he would fold the paper over and he would melt candle wax over it and use that signet ring to press his signature into it. And he said, yeah. My boy's going to wear that ring now. Is that how you would do it? <laughs> your son just spent half of your wealth and you gave him the family gold card? That's real grace. That's God saying, no, you're not a probationary member of this family. You belong in this family. That's what you get when you come to him. When you come clean, when you're honest, when you're humble, and you say, God, take me back, he, he changes your status entirely. Then he said, 
put shoes on his feet. And that's a vision change. Because the son had a vision of how this was going to work out. I'm going to go back. I'm going to be a servant. Now, in ancient Near Eastern culture, they gave servants clothes, but they didn't give them shoes. Sons have shoes. Servants don't have shoes. And the father was telling him, I got your plan, but I got a better plan for you. He he was saying, I'm not worthy to live in the house. I'm going to be a hired servant. That's what the text says, a hired servant. There's a house servant who is trusted. And then there's a, and he lives in the house. But if you can't trust that servant, he's a, he's a hired servant. And he lives in the field, like living in a barn. And the boy said, I'm going to be the lowest that there is. And the father said, no, we're going to give him shoes because he's not just going to be a in the field servant. And he's not just going to be in the house servant. He's going to be a son. What God's telling you today is you need to take the expectations you've come in with and throw them away and know that God's got better expectations for you. He's not going to be the God of okay. He's going to be the God of abundance in your life. Okay means you don't go to hell. Man, there's a lot of years I lived my life for Jesus like, if I could just not go to hell. That's serving the God of okay. But I want to serve the God of abundance. They called him El Shaddai in the Old Testament. El Shaddai, God who is more than enough. See, y'all serve El Get By sometimes. He's El Shaddai. You're trying to just get by. Oh, God, if you just help me pay my bills. Oh, God, if you just help my husband act right. God, if you, God wants to do so much more. When you come to him, man, he changes your vision. And lastly, there's a divine change. I call that one the divine change because killing the fatted calf fulfills the scripture that says there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of innocent blood. And these ancient Jews would have understood that. They killed an innocent animal to symbolize that when you come home to Jesus, somebody has to pay for your sin. I know some of you are like, man, this is a soft soap thing. You're just trying to build a crowd. You're trying to make it too easy. Let me make something abundantly clear for you. Nothing about forgiveness is easy. Nothing. It's the hardest thing in the world. The good news is somebody already did it for you. He died on the cross. He poured out his last drop of blood to you, for you and me. And see, this story is important because it wasn't just one family with one rebellious son a long time ago. This is a lot of people hearing me right now. But I think I can say this with truth. Everybody here has been rebellious toward God. Romans 3 and 23 says, We have all sinned and we are all short of the glory and the grace of God. Nobody here deserves it. Man, people that are singing on this stage are not up here or me preaching because we're, we're righteous. We have all sinned and we are short of the glory of God. But we have received the change that His blood gave us. If you're wondering, man, how's God going to take me? How's God going to accept me? How's the family of God going to receive me if I truly humble myself before God and ask Him to be my Lord and to forgive me? Let me tell you, you might have been places where they'll judge you and point fingers at you, but the true church of the living God is going to do this right here for you. They're going to say, man, you're coming home? Man, go up there, get the best robe I got, put it on his back, man, make him look like me. He's going to say, let me me get that fancy ring and put him on his finger and let him know he can start praying prayers for abundance and God will start casting those prayers in for him. He's going to say, put shoes on him that carry him to a better place than he thought he was going to go. And finally, let's have a party, y'all. My daughter was dead and she's alive. My son was lost and he's home. That's how the real family of God and the true only, one and only God will embrace you when you come home.